Welcome back, everyone, to the Zero K 2v2 Anniversary Tournament. Our main, your host, Dominic, and we are into the Grand Finals. It's going to be Gregory, Buzzy, Beetle, GBC, whatever, versus Endgame Boss. That's what it's going to be. We have, the first map is going to be on Iceland, because that was the choice. Which is kind of weird, because Diamond and Hokomoko picked it, even though they originally didn't have the map pick, but that is the way things go because they asked for it nicely so they got the map pick afterwards and picked iceland which is a pretty neat map so iceland kind of a large map we haven't seen it in a while very large very econ heavy so if we're worried about comebacks this actually is a map that could potentially provide them diamond friend already going for late vehicles hokumoko going for air it's actually kind of funny this is the first match we had in a while where it wasn't rar so we're not necessarily going to see commander rushes first time in a while come to think of it yeah, it's a weird thought when you put it that way. But yeah, don't expect commander rushes. Not super likely to happen. That's a weird thought. No, anyway. So yeah, Iceland. With a lot of trees. I don't know, maybe I don't know if Iceland's known for that. I mean for all I know, this map was named after the supermarket, not after the country. I mean, it doesn't look like a supermarket to me. Eh, whatever. Sparkle's also going for rovers. Mana 12, not sure what they're going to be going for themselves. Looks kind of weird. I mean, planes kind of make sense. No, cloakies! Okay. Rovers against cloakies. Or sorry, rover playing against rover cloakie. Interesting choice. I'm not sure I totally understand, but cool. Why not? Give it a shot, see what happens. So, of course, immediately getting the Swifts up to try to set... Actually, not immediately, not of course. Swifts for scouting kind of makes sense, but that's also risky. Because one of the reasons you might want to go for early air like that is to get a bunch of Ravens and then use that to bomb a commander. So, bit of a giveaway. Interesting choice there. Using the Swifts as a way of scouting things out to see what's going on, but again, that comes the cost of sacrificing information. So I expect we will be seeing some air coming or anti-air coming in from endgame boss as soon as they realize what's going on. Whereas Gregory Buzzy Beetle is not quite as good of a position. I mean they're in an okay position. I mean they don't have as much in the way of motion of movement and mobility. They do have a lot in the way of well anti-air, they have a lot in the way of cloaked units. I mean they've already got couple conjurers going already. Of course, cloaking is what I was saying. In the way of workers. They've got a couple conjurers being built up already. They already are going to be going for very, very fast expansion. The Swift probably won't be able to do too much either, just considering it's like one unit. Actually, didn't really do much. And there's already anti-air there. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot really that can be done here. Other than scouting out a little bit. This That is the thing with this map. This is a larger map. It becomes harder to actually push when you don't have a massive advantage later on in the game. Like, early in the game, you're not going to get early rushes. But that's not surprising. Both of these teams are fairly strong economically, so I expect both of them are going to be playing this quite well. I expect they know, they both know exactly how they want to have this set up, too. Like, how they want to have all their economy work so that the whole thing works out. Same time, though, they're just sending some napalm bombers to burn, die, and try kill something and not succeed. That that happens too. That that too is an option. You, you can do that. It's valid. Don't know if I recommend it, but that was what was gone for, so that's what they have to deal with. Of course, this whole time, this endgame boss has been building up their economy and building up a fairly defensive economy too. And not a whole lot of ways that Gregory Buzzy Beetle has to get in. They don't have a lot of options on the ground. I mean, they have their rovers, but that's not much. Their air units are being torn apart as they go. The cranes could be used to build up, like building up over this expansion over the north side of the map. Maybe build over the southeast a bit faster than the ro than the mason gets to it. But otherwise, no. At the same time, though, Scorch is coming in, trying to do what they can, but not really finding all that much value. Getting... A Lotus and a Metal Extractor at the cost of one of them and a lot of Reclaim donated to their opponent. Like, 150 Metal Reclaim donated to their opponent. Not sure that was necessarily worth it. Slowed expansion down a little bit, though, so probably 
wasn't the worst thing in the world, probably break even at worst. But at the same time, Endgame Boss has a 15 metal per second lead. They've expanded a lot faster than Gregory Buzzy Beetle. And Gregory Buzzy Beetle has not been able to outrave them. Well, the same thing can be said in reverse. There's a Scythe coming in. You're getting rid of a Mason with basically no issue whatsoever. That Mason had no chance. Bit of a shame there for the Mason, but that's how it goes sometimes. At the same time, the Gremlin's coming in, making that Swift very nervous about where it decides to place itself. This just doesn't really work. It's. I can see why planes have not been very popular in a while for 2v2. I mean, really, like this entire tournament, most 2v2 tournaments, really, we don't see a lot of planes. And it kind of makes sense because it seeds a lot of the ground control, and we can see what's happening with that. Like, the amount of control that Endgame Boss has over this map compared to the control that GBC has, it's pretty telling just how much it matters whether or not you have ground forces to secure your expansions. And especially given that this was revealed early, allowing all these gremlins to be built, which I'll admit they aren't able to defend against the ground forces, but it may not even matter. Just the amount of damage that's been dealt by size, the amount of damage that's been dealt by these anti-air units that are making the air force not really effective, and thus the opportunity cost of going for the air force compared to another ground army, that hasn't really paid off. I do wish GBC would expand a little further, like send the crane over to the south and deal with expanding over there. And I get what it's doing with the reclaim, and... It is ultimately going to go over to the south, but by the time it does that, it's going to have to deal with all this other stuff that's being built up. Like a commander that's coming in here that doesn't, although admittedly doesn't have a whole lot going for it, but it's still a commander. It still has the Lotus. Will laser, but it, is it going to be enough? It is going to be enough. It isn't going to be able to get away, but it doesn't defend against anything else in the metal extractor. So the commander does escape, but at the cost of the economy that it had built up beforehand, still though, that's going to allow it to continue to expand. That was still the right move. It's going to be able to go from there get the rest of the metal extractors, and then that will allow it to continue along. But at the same time, the North Commander could very well go down. Getting knocked down a little bit. Taking a fair bit of damage shouldn't be too much. Might be. It's kind of hard to say. Now, one more shot comes in there, and that is it. The Commander goes down. Goodbye, Commander. Endgame boss losing one of their Commanders, putting them in GBC at the exact same economy. Or at least the exact same metal value. One more commander death would be enough, and honestly, that commander is pretty weak and doesn't have a whole lot of anti-air next to it. So, you know, sending one of those ravens down south might not be the best, that might not be the worst idea. And looks like that is not, however, on the agenda. Something like it might be. The ravens are being sent south-ish, just it looks like they're sending over a gremlin. They aren't, however, going for the commander, but if they did, that would be a major blow. That would give endgame boss a lot less room to just maneuver. Unfortunately, Ravens needs to try to get rid of some of these Scorchers, and it is super risky. I don't agree with this at all. It's, I mean, it is working, I guess, well enough, but it is not worth it. That was two Ravens to the cost of, what, three Scorchers? Not what I would consider to be value. I mean, maybe Dying Frontier disagrees, but I, or Hokumoka rather disagrees. Not really what I would think about. Like I said, this commander, uh, okay, no longer one bomb away from death, pretty close to. Two bombs would still kill it. No anti-air is nearby. So it's still quite available. Still quite open to get knocked down. But it may not be enough. At the same time, the north side is being taken. Gregory, okay, GBC is getting their their two. They are getting their metal extractors. They're actually getting a tank factory as well. Just being the safe side. It's just, you know, they could also stop the expansions going down south at the same time. And get rid of the commander economy. But right now, the big thing is making the most of the economy they do indeed have, which... I mean, they got 15 metal per sec... Or 14 metal per second going into this factory. Top of another 15 going into the main one. It's just... they, GBC is accessing. Whereas Endgame Boss, they have plenty of infrastructure to actually build up. At the Air Factory, they have four caretakers. Fifth one's being built up. So Endgame Boss is just using all this metal far more effectively than GBC is. The main thing with GBC is that they, they have been doing the airstrikes where they need to. Those have been some reasonably intelligent airstrikes. Again, I don't agree with throwing these Ravens essentially away. But other than that, it's worked out all right. Just the one downside is going to be, like, how do you actually deal with all this other stuff? The fact that the map control is... It's sort of even, but kind of tenuously so. Endgame boss really does have the advantage here. I don't see anything going in favor of 
Gregory Buzzy Beetle other than the fact that they have air, and even then, that's... Well, that's pretty tenuous. There's a Swift. Hello, Swift. You are a Swift. You are the air control option. Yeah, well, I can't really focus on this thing. But yeah. So, Swifts are already up. There's already anti-air coming in for endgame boss. They already had anti-air on the ground for a while. And Scythe's coming in getting rid of all the naked expansions because the cranes are not building naked expansions, or they are building naked expansions. And that's the problem with not having the ground forces. Now, granted, tanks are up. Tanks are a thing. They exist. They have the blitzes, a couple of blitzes up. It's not bad, but this is a bit late in the game for blitzes to be of much use. So it does kind of feel like there's not a whole lot going in favor of endgame of Grigor Busy Beetle other than, I don't know, a wing and a, a, well, a wing and a prayer, I want to say that, but it's like, yeah, that's kind of it, though. That's all they got. And their wings are being clipped quite quickly. But admittedly, it's not so bad. An air pad would be preferable. Like, I, I actually would really like to see an air pad be built up. I don't understand how else this could possibly work in any useful way without an air pad. But maybe I just don't understand things. I'm not sure. But what I do understand is that the north side of the map has been lost to Gregory Buzzy Beetle. The south side of the map is being threatened by them, and actually the Scorchers are doing a pretty fine job getting rid of Mason Scorchers. Basically any opposition they come in contact with. So definitely cost effective. But that Phantom again causing lots of problems, so I don't see it. Like the Phantoms... The Phantom is hurting. Or the Phantom is making hurting happen. Phantom is making pain. I don't know what to say. I feel like I'm a menace to words. But that that's also true of Endgame Boss here, being a menace to metal extractors and masons both. As this entire southeast section of the map is torn to pieces, Endgame Boss basically setting up what looks to be their, I don't know if the final push, just a really important raid. But these Scorchers are just about uncontested. That might very well be a final push for how much damage is being dealt. I mean, if they can go uphill, if the Scorchers can go uphill without getting killed, this could very well be it. The Scorchers are running in parallel, no retreating coming in from the red side. Gregor Busy Beetle not managing to get this. The retreat micro is in favor of Endgame Boss. Still have three Scorchers in the base and no defenses to really contest them. One more Scorcher is coming up, and of course, every Scorcher that dies is a Scorcher that is going to be reclaimed by Gregory Buzzy Beetle, so... Bit of a metal donation, but that was at the cost of a bunch of metal extractors over to the south. Still worth it. Still massively reducing the amount of territory and economy that Gregory Buzzy Beetle has to bear, or that can bring to bear. Endgame boss is just ripping everything apart. There's that phantom coming in to tear apart the metal extractors. There's not much beyond that to be said. The metal extractor is really kind of what it comes down to. And indeed, there goes another couple swifts. Going down very quickly. And I don't really have any other idea what's going to happen other than a self-destruct. That is going to be it. Endgame boss takes game one of the grand finals on Iceland. But if not a terrible distant game. It wasn't super close. I think the air factory wasn't the best option. But it wasn't the worst thing in the world. And I like the fact that metal used... No, nah, metal used is actually pretty far apart. I don't like the fact that metal used was so far apart. A lot of it was reclaim. Endgame boss... Okay, a lot of it was them. They could have used more of it. No, no, that's a reclaim. Excess. Excess, my bad, yeah. GBC totally excessed. A lot. And people were talking about that in chat. The Dime Throne is a professional excessor. They accessed a thousand whole metal. Hmm. Not sure I consider that professional. I think they're I think they need to work hard on the excess. Excess more. But anyway, that was game one. So game two. Again, as always, it's going to be down to the Lose your team. It's going to be down to the GBC. What they want to go for. Because that is their prerogative. And it looks like Icy Shell. For what may very well be the final game of the 0k 2v2 anniversary tournament. Anniversary of the Steam release, by the way, for those of you wondering. This is going to be a pretty close game. It's certainly going to be a close map. It's... Very tiny. Not a whole lot of room to maneuver. So, yeah, that's the thing. It's important to bear in mind. It's actually pretty tight. Pretty small. So, we'll see what happens with that. I expect it will be f fine. Like, I expect it won't be a major problem. 
but I don't know. Maybe. I'm actually kind of curious. I mean, what is going to happen here? Because it is, like I said, it is a tiny map. And so it's not a map that's going to be really all that, I don't want to say all that playable, but it's like, we've seen, we've seen a lot of maps this today where it's been either kind of small and easy to just do one single push on or larger and more of an economy map. But this is a weird combination of the two. Icy Shell is a tiny map. I think it's 8x8. Eight eight. But it's got a huge amount of metal strategies. Not that I've seen people play defensively successfully on this map. Like, I actually have a game from years ago that I casted that was basically a showcase of how to play defensively. And it was on Icy Shell. And I think it only really worked because Icy Shell is just that kind of silly. I mean, honestly, I think it was just because Icy Shell is the kind of map where you could pull that off specifically. I don't think it was necessarily because Icy Shell, or because defensive play is a viable option, but Icy Shell can allow for it. So, if there's any map we might see a comeback on based on economy, it would be this one. Or based on defending into economy and then out, and then pushing back and dealing with your opponent, it would be Icy Shell. Yeah, I need a better chair. So yeah, Icy Shell, definitely a useful option. <clears throat> ah! Wow, good thing the tournament's almost over. Yeah, definitely a a choice that's going to be possibly useful for Dying for Nokomoko. I'm curious how it's going to work out. I'm also losing my voice. So apologies if I sound kind of weird and horse and froggy. If I sound like a horse frog. So starting out, we have... Endgame boss split up, very much focused on taking the mid to late game with center being something they take later on. While at the same time, GBC looks like they want this highly defensive play. I was talking about earlier how that's a thing that you can kind of do. And I I almost feel like GBC is just going to be going for a rush. We already have Dying Frame pushing heavily into the center. And Boy pushing as well. Yeah, this is this looks like an all-in. I agree with Nuzzy. This is definitely looking... I wouldn't say necessarily all-in. I think 0k is not the kind of game we generally see all-ins on. And that generally might be the operative word here. Glaives are being used to try to help a little bit to get an idea of what's going on. See what's being built up. Find out where their opponents are, which at this point is pretty clear the opponents are in the corners. I mean, whether both corners or just one corner yet to be seen, but I think I think it's been figured out that's one corner. And the thing is, all in might actually work. They do have the metal extractor in the center, so there's some room to build up. There's actually room to continue the economy. It's not a complete wash. It's actually reasonably safe. There even is a constructor in the main base, a conjurer building up some power supplies just to be on the safe side to allow both factors to continue at full capacity. And considering that already there's been a commander upgrade to a rocket launcher and both commanders together, yeah, this is definitely an all in, but the thing is, because their opponents were split at the beginning, because Endgame Boss decided to go for the later game strategy, they can't easily reinforce each other. A flank will be coming in sooner or later, but sooner or later may not be soon enough. There's the push coming in here. We already have the commander pushing as far as it can. I mean, I'm not entirely sure I agree with how much we're seeing this push come in from Hokomoko, but it is still doing a fairly good job. This base could actually go down. And if the commander goes down, if Sparkles loses their commander, Sparkles loses their commander that could very well be enough of a disadvantage. I mean, the rock launcher coming in here, wiping out the entire production side. There's the one ripper, the one hope to save this side of the map. And the thing is, having done that, now they can push in, because, you know, divide and conquer is a really common strategy idea. But the thing is, the opponents divided themselves, so the conquest is pretty much... It's pretty much handed on a silver platter to GBC. Like, endgame boss... Now, one of the commanders, I and mean, both the commanders are over here. Now it's kind of evened out a little bit. But, again, the main base for GBC is still building up at full capacity. It's not like anything is going wrong with the amount of economy there. So, GBC is still getting reinforcements, still getting units, still set up against this Lotus. Against all these units, actually. Same time, though, this recon commander does have a machine gun. Not really much of a surprise there to have a machine gun. I mean, why wouldn't you, really, all things considered? Useful tool to have, especially when you have a bunch of raiders to deal with. Glaives and such. Glaives, ducks, whatever. 
But yeah, again, because the main base is being built up, it's it can be well defended. Even as the rest of the forces are up front, even as they're dealing with this machine gun commander, it's still not going to be a big problem. Although I do kind of wish time for me to heal up Hokomoku's commander, but either way, defenses are an option. What the heck is that Blitz corpse doing? Oh, whatever. Not sure how that Blitz died. Because Kodachi missed and hit his own teammate. But yeah, the one thing here is that Dime or Hokomoku's commander does need to be protected a little bit, and I wish Dime Farin would actually heal Hokomoku's commander, because, you know, that would help. That is kind of the stronger commander, but oh, we'll see what happens. Another commander coming in here. Rocket launcher against a bunch of pickets and a lotus, and clearly not seen as a threat, as the remaining defenses are being knocked down by the boys and Rockos, just wasting all the endgame boss cash. Like all the resources for endgame boss being torn to pieces, put into metal extra put into defenses, and not really used for anything else. And of course the center metal extractor isn't being contested either. And it's worth noting, tanks can't contest it. Not without an emissary. But that's the thing, that was light vehicles tank as rover's tanks, and the center is bot pathable only. So without artillery, there's no way for the center to actually be threatened, which means great for Gregory Buzzy Beetle. The GBC is doing fine. They've got this in the bag, they've got this sorted. They don't have to worry about anything. All they have to worry about right now is making sure that they have a they have a good setup. That's all they need. Just as long as they can keep the setup going, which they have, then they're fine. This defense defense is perfect. Defense is good. The offense is good. The game might well very well be over. We could be going into game. It looks like we're going into game three. GBC pushed in, did a lot of damage. I actually really enjoyed this. This was. This is a great way to set this all up. I mean, I wasn't expecting it to be quite so decisive, but apparently that's how it goes. We are going to be having a very decisive match in here, and, well, Game 3 is still Game 3, end game boss. They are still being challenged, but they do get to choose the next map, assuming they lose. I mean, assuming if there is no next map, if they win, there's no next map. If they lose, there is a next map, and it's up to them. However, there is still the push... Last final stretch, last final attempt, maybe find something, but not even close. GBC losing basically no units in the process of taking out the Kodachis. I mean, the two commanders are still around, but then again, so are the two commanders for the other side. Actually, wait, aren't they? Yep, they're both around. Pokemon and Dimefrain both alive with their commanders, both getting the defenses up, getting that contain going. 19 metal per second for endgame boss. GBC, however, like, they could get far more of an economy. Like, they could very easily start setting up. I mean, they are getting overdrive onto their metal extractors, especially that center one. But, I mean, they could set up a bunch of metal extractors around the map and then be in an amazing position just in case. Like, even if the contain breaks, endgame boss would be 16 metal per second against 80 metal per second. That could happen. And, like, in fact, GBC is going for that. They're building up metal extractors. They're getting their economy going just in case. I do think they could go in for the win right now. I don't think they actually have to hold back. Especially as an emissary is being built. As the one thing that could get rid of the center metal extractor is being built up. But, yeah, that's still possibly going to be it. The commander coming in here. Why are you doing this? This Okay, the commander clearly having a bit of a death wish coming in here from Sparkles. But it's, well, it's not going to have that achieved. I suppose that's good news. Commander stays alive one more day. However, I just don't see that happening. Oh, but on the other hand, Okamoko losing their commander to an emissary. So the emissary is actually doing a great job with the contain, but again, it's a matter of can the contain be preserved? Like, can it be maintained long enough to main get this economy going? And I think so, but the Kodachis are making that difficult. The Kodachis are make actually making that significantly difficult. Now, granted, Dimefriend's commander is still in a reasonably okay position. But yeah, considering the emissary this is a threat and i still feel like you know, i understand why, why gbc doesn't want to push unless it's a good time like this is the best time to push because you know if they lose this they lose and they've gone for an all-in push and it has worked out really well but obviously if they lose that then they have really no chance now gbc can only do so much they can only push in about as far as they have the confidence to. That That's really the problem, is that GBC does not have the confidence that they can actually get through the forces here, because they could. Like, from the spectator's eye view, 
a half dozen ducks could beat this. Like, there is nothing here that's causing a threat. Even with the machine gun, the ducks just deal enough alpha damage. It doesn't even matter. And there's more than half a dozen ducks. Like, that's just this part of the army is half a dozen ducks. On top of the fact that this whole economy is being built up around the entire map, a lot of stuff is being set up. Gregory, like, GBC is just doing fine. And once they get to the Kodachi here, which the ducks are about to do, there is really no external threat. That's it. That's over. It's it's done. All they need to do, all GBC has to do is push. All they have to do is actually take the fight to endgame boss, and they will win. Though that is becoming decreasingly true as time goes on, but still, it's, it is becoming a thing. Like, it is clear that GBC doesn't have really anything on the ground to deal with this stuff. But now with the ogre up, that's hard to say. That ogre is making things even harder to actually be definite about, and the emissaries are making the commander push not a really solid option. Kind of risky. I mean, Emissary is dealing 600 damage a shot. I suppose it's not that risky, but, you know, it still softens things up. It could still make the difference. So really, I'd just like to see this push happen. Like, go in here. Take out the Emissaries. Take out the Lotus. Take out everything. Just wipe it all out. I don't care. Destroy it. If it's gone, it's done. Although, I... Why are you scared? GBC, stop being scared. You have twice their economy. Just push and kill. I get that they're probably not... It's not going to matter, ultimately, because, I mean... People are pointing out that there's other large maps. People are saying GBC... It's not actually... People are saying Comic Catcher. Comic Catcher, I don't think, is in the list. But that's not really the point. The point is, GBC won the game five minutes ago and just doesn't want to take the W. Like, take the win. Just take it. It's right there. It's yours. Or it was. It belonged to you. You had it. You probably could still have it, actually. Emissaries aren't that scary. Although, admittedly, if those phantoms coming in here, I guess that's more of a guaranteed kill. At least guaranteed threat on the commander. Like, guaranteed marking the commander's life. I think the commander... Are they, are they worried about this? Are they not worried about this? No, they're not worried about this. Great emissary shot, actually. <laughs> not worried about it at all. Yeah, this is... Uh, there's so much so much firepower here. The ducks alone could take out the commander. But again, as time is passing, endgame boss is reclaiming more and more metal. They're getting themselves back in this game. If we want to see a comeback, this could very well be in the comeback. Uh, it's a bit of a shame. It's really... it. I just would have liked to see Gregory Busy Beetle actually push in and take the win. At least go... 2-1, two, two, if nothing else, or 1-2, if nothing else. But now we're seeing the darts come in here. Now the momentum's totally being lost. Like, again, endgame boss, they still have an economic disadvantage, but it doesn't matter. They've gotten themselves back in position as far as actual power goes. They've gotten themselves in a reasonably good spot as far as defense goes. Like I said, Icy Shell is the kind of map you can play defensive on, get your economy going, and t come back. If any map is going to allow for a comeback, it's this one. And we're seeing that right now. Now, granted, that was because GBC allowed the comeback. I mean, they could have pushed, and they could have killed. They really could have. <clears throat> but they are... It doesn't matter now. Like, now at this point, GBC has to play the honest game. And while they do have an economic advantage with which to play it, it's not clearly translating into the units they need. Not translating units that actually get rid of the commanders, not translating units to get rid of the ogre. The unit counters are perfect on the side of endgame boss, and GBC is just losing everything as a result. Like, that was an amazing... That was a great breakout. And from there, what do we have? Metal used now... Still, GBC is 3k higher for metal used, but only 1k higher for actual army value. And, like, just absolutely scared of... Well, yeah, one... <laughs> stream chat's right. Stop making duck, but also, stop being scared of using duck. Ducks are good. Ducks do a lot of damage. Ducks got buffed recently. Like, they're they're strong units. But, no, that's clearly not happening. Also, Lewis lost the metal extract in the center, but still, GBC's... Man, they got an economic advantage, regardless. Like, no matter how it goes, they've got an economic advantage. It's just a matter of making sure that that economic advantage actually pans out. Especially as Endgame Boss has been retaking a lot of metal extractors, has been taking a lot of ground. Has been harassing all over the place, doing a great job of it, too. 
There's even more damage coming in here. The ducks are still reasonably strong for that. But now, okay, there is a grizzly coming up. That will help. I don't think it'll do the trick, but it will help. It'll do some extra damage. So there is that. Got their grizzly up. Like, yay, grizzly, yay. But it, I don't see it doing much, honestly. Like, it's going to be able to take out some of the units, thin the herd a little bit as far as endgame boss's army is concerned. But again, their army's not very big. The main threats are the emissaries and, to a lesser extent, the commanders. That's about it. And the units to deal with, and the darts, I suppose, to stop the... Well, ever actually, no, no, okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, the Grizzlies can get rid of the darts pretty effectively. That helps the, the phantoms be able to move forward and actually deal some damage. And then with the phantoms being able to deal the damage, that does allow for a threat for the emissaries and the commander. Along with the Grizzly, you know, taking a lot of heat for the emissaries. Hopefully phantoms don't get blown up by the emissaries again, but that was pretty amazing, to be honest. That was a really good setup, but still, uh, emissaries here... Like, they are... Okay, there we go. The ducks coming in. The emissaries here are still a threat, but they are going to be heavily threatened. The ducks coming in should be able to at least provide enough of a threat to be a problem. Actually, yeah, the, the darts are all gone. The ducks can move in and get rid of the fencers. Now, without the fencers, there's not a whole lot of defenses coming in here. That is going to be it. Mana 12 resigning. Okay, that is resign coming in from endgame boss. GBC's rush with a bit of delay. Ultimately... Throws in the towel and makes it a 1-1. One, one. We are moving on to game three. I mean, GBC could have won that sooner, but they still won that eventually. It was almost a comeback, but it got pushed back. But yeah, that was GBC's round match to lose, or game to lose. But now, of course, it is going to be a matter of what their opponents go for. Because this isn't over yet. I mean, we're still on game three. We have one game left. One game left in the entire tournament, mind you. So this is the last game of the entire 2v2 anniversary tournament. And it is going to be on a map of Madness Wells and Tar Sparkles' Choice. And it's going to be Red Comet. Oh, right. Actually, hang on. Sorry. There's one small thing. If... Prior to mention, actually. So, game three. This is really important now. This is game three of the grand finals. But, because GBC came in from the lower bracket, should they win this, they're actually going to be going on to another best of three, unless that was changed. I'm pretty sure it's all best of three. I'm pretty sure it's as shown. I don't think it's a best of five. So, that does mean that... If Sparkles and Manu 12 win this, it's the end. If Dimefront and Hokomoko win this, it'll actually go on to a bracket reset. And if it goes for a bracket reset, well, then we're in for another two or three games. So I'm really not sure how this is going to go. Like, Dimefront and Hokomoko, obviously, they want to win that, but it's going to be a bit of a push. However, Red Comet being the map it is, and being the larger map it is, and being a map that's kind of easier to set up in a way that's less personally risky means that there's a lot more room for Sparkles and Mana 12 to actually deal with this. Like, you know, they can... Oops. They can actually get themselves set up in a way that allows them to not have to worry about that at all. Like, they have... Obviously, as you can see, their two start locations right next to each other. And we might maybe see Dimefront and Hokomoko go to this top left, try to win that way. I kind of don't expect it, but who knows? Maybe they will. Dimefront going to the center. If you see top left, that would be kind of amazing as a way of trying to counter it. But no, no, we're seeing actually Hokomoko and Dimefront starting in the exact same position. So interesting choice there. I don't... I don't know how well it's going to work. I feel like it's not. I mean, we've seen same position starts before, and we saw it last time it worked, but... Icy Shell is a smaller map. Icy Shell is a much smaller map. But we are seeing Ogres. We have two, well, okay, one Guardian Commander. It's not quite the same layout as last time. Ogres and Glaives, not entirely unusual. <clears throat> so, with that, I don't expect another rush like last time. I mean, it worked last time, but this time there isn't the same division. The two players, Endgame Boss can defend itself pretty well. The two players are very near each other. They're not on opposite sides of the map. 
However, we are still seeing a bit of a push. Not necessarily a rush, but definitely a push. Oh no, this is a rush. No, no, this is it. Dying friend. Dying friend's going for the ogre rush. They're going to try it. And I do not agree with the use of all of these darts and scorchers. I don't see it. It's not going to work against the ogre. I mean, maybe... Maybe Blitz would, but that's about it. The ogre is going to be able to just deal with everything. It is a riot unit, after all. That is its job. And on top of that rocket launcher, so anything at a larger distance is not going to be able to do any real work. So certainly GBC is pushing hard. They want it. They want to take this map, or at the very least, if not, take the game immediately. But whichever way things go, it is going to be a very decisive match. Just because, I mean, GBC has decided, no, we're going in. We're going forward. They've made a choice. They've staked their claim on the entire map. And it's a matter of whether or not GBC can actually hold that claim. Because Endgame Boss obviously doesn't want to let that go. But there it is. There's the Ogre coming in here. Endgame Boss has had a fair amount of time to prepare. The Blitzes are coming in. And the Blitzes do stun out the Ogre. The last second, this Dart's coming in here to slow it down as well on top of that. Just to make it a little bit easier to get rid of. And down goes the Ogre. Dying Front's commander forced to retreat as a result. And a nice little bit of reclaim coming in for Endgame Boss. So, not really successful. Not in the slightest. 400 metal reclaim for Endgame Boss. Pushing them that little bit extra ahead of their opponent. And then from there, going for the counterattack. Dart Fencer on top of everything else is not fun. Not pretty. Well, not fun for GBC. It's fun for Endgame Boss. They did a really good job there. And on top of that, the Blitz... Oof. Not able to do too much. Blitz coming in here from Endgame Boss. But yeah, GBC Blitz... Did a pretty decent job there, but the fence are still just wearing it down. Ultimately getting destroyed, and with that... I also the slow, too. That should really helped out there. Darts are a support unit. They're a strong support unit that way. But now the counterattack from Endgame Boss, on top of the fact that they're still expanding and still reclaiming a bunch. I mean, that was a lot that they got the reclaim on. Still another 30 seconds worth of reclaim. Actually, more than that now, because this entire field, 500 metal. Yeah, it's another minute of reclaim top of everything else, so top of the expansions that are inevitably going to happen, on top of the fact that the expansions are happening, and the extra power, and yeah, Endgame Boss is doing really well economically, and I understand why GBC pushed in, and I like the fact that GBC is expanding at the same time, or to be precise, Hokomoko is expanding at the same time, Dying Freund is just continuing to be reckless. Like, Dying Freund is just pushing in, doing everything they can, and trying to do something here to get some damage in, to try to harass a bit, but that probably isn't happening. The Fencers, I mean, they're being a bit of a problem. They're not completely dead, but now you have two commanders coming in here. On top of everything, on top of all the blitzes, on top of the Fencer damage that had been dealt before. Dying Freund losing their commander right now. There it goes. Stunned out and killed. Commander down on top of the blitz that was already at the front lines. Endgame boss has really nothing they have to deal with other than Hokomoko expanding a little bit in, honestly, rather unsafe ways. Like, massive naked expansion from Hokomoko. No defenses at... None! Are, there's two Lotuses. That's it. So, otherwise, no defenses whatsoever coming in from Gregory Buzzy Beetle. Endgame boss, they can just build out. They don't even need to push. They just need to expand. Just build out, expand. I mean, they can push some pressure if they'd like to. It's not going to hurt. But, yeah, just expand. Get a bunch of metal. Turn them into units. Maybe apply pressure in the meantime while using the extra metal to continue to apply more units. And no, that's going to be it. Doesn't even have to do that. Dying for an Okamoko, throw in the towel, realizing there's not a whole lot they can do, having lost pretty much their entire force, honestly. So yeah, with that, that is, that's it. That is tournament. That is, well, I guess it's a bit disappointing at the end of the matchup, but yeah, that is going to be that. So, should double check. I'm just going to double check that that is in fact the end of the tournament. I do believe it is. Unless there's something I'm not aware of as far as the way that the tournament was supposed to proceed. I think... I think that's it. Assuming that it is... It... I think that's everything. Okay, that is everything. Got it confirmed from Shaman. We are... That is it. That is the tournament. That is the la That was the final match of the tournament. 
So, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. It was the first double elimination tournament we've had in a while, so... Yeah, apologies for some of the delays that happened. It occasionally can take a little while to get in. But, yeah, so... Thank you for watching. Congratulations to... Endgame Boss, Manitoba and Sparkles for winning. To... I'm gonna try this. Grzegorz Brzezkiewicz... Krzyzewicz... Voshicha. Couldn't quite get that in one. Oh well. Pokemon going to die for it. And finally, North Chilean G and Rar for third place. And also, Jake G and Nuzzy, Nuzzy, also known as Langustine, who both kind of newer players, getting fourth place is not bad considering. And they had to fight for that too. That was not free. So, yeah, well done there. So, that was that. Thank you for watching. Thanks to Shaman for hosting. And. Also, Shaman Dunfer were streaming as well, so if you wanted to watch their stuff, you can see their stream records at their channels. I mean, let's put the links in the stream chat. I mean, if you're watching on YouTube, it's a little late for that now. But, yeah, there's... They have channels, too, so... Go check those out, and otherwise... I think I'm just gonna put them in the description so you can watch the records. I have to remember to actually put those in the descriptions. Ah, okay, what's... <clears throat> Actually, there's quite a few people who are streaming their own tournament stuff. Cool. Well, anyway, glad to see that. So, again, thank you all for watching. Thanks for everyone for playing. Congratulations to the winners for winning. And that is gonna... And thanks again, Shaman, for organizing. That is gonna be it for me. Have a good night, everyone.